is Lee Spector, and the presentation I'm going to give is called Evolution Evolves with Autoconstruction. This is a presentation for the workshop on evolutionary computation for the automated design of algorithms at the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference, also known as GECCO, in 2016. The first thing I'm going to do is to describe what autoconstructive evolution is. Um, I'll talk a little bit about prior work on autoconstructive evolution, and then I'll get to the recent developments that the current paper is about. I'll describe some results of that and give you a sense of what I think are the prospects for autoconstructive evolution in the future. So what is autoconstructive evolution? Well, it's a 15-year-old project, so it's something that we've been working on for a long time. Um, and you might think of it as genetic programming, but harder and less successful. Um, that doesn't sound um, particularly exciting, maybe at first, but the goals are quite ambitious uh, to do something beyond what genetic programming can normally do. And uh, while we have not yet got there, um, um, I would like to try to convince you throughout this presentation that there are some tantalizing um, possibilities if we can indeed get it to work well. So the first publication was back in Gecko 2001, and there has been a series of um, developments since then with a number of uh, intermediate publications, and I'll go through some of those briefly soon. The most recent system described in the current paper for this workshop is called Autodog, and <clears throat> the reason we felt it was time to write something new about it is that although it's still does not outperform ordinary genetic programming, it is now able to solve some significant problems. It is perhaps doing better than it ever has before, and we think that the results um, that we're getting now might uh, give us a good indication of what we have to do in the near future to make it work much better. In a little more detail, the idea of autoconstructive evolution is to evolve evolution while evolving solutions. Okay? So there are many aspects of an evolutionary computation system, including genetic programming systems, that are handwritten by people um, to, uh, um, to try to make evolution work well. And the idea here is to get many of those things, or at least the most crucial things, to themselves evolve. Um, the way that we do that in autoconstructive evolution is that we have the individuals themselves that are evolving in the population being responsible not only to solving a target problem, but also for making their own offspring and introducing the variation in their own offspring. Um, the idea is that the methods that produce offspring and that produce variation in offspring are in the individuals themselves and are therefore themselves subject to variation and evolution. So that the reproductive mechanisms evolve as individuals evolve and as their problem-solving ability evolves. In order to get this right, it requires a somewhat deeper understanding of the evolution of variation than we need when we do ordinary genetic algorithms or genetic programming. Uh, in those systems, we hand uh, design and build in the uh, methods of variation. We don't let them evolve. And so it's a, it's a more complicated game we're trying to play here. But the hypothesis is that we might be able to produce evolutionary computation systems that are more powerful um, with autoconstructive evolution than we can write by hand. Because the hypothesis is um, evolution can find ways of doing evolution better than we can figure out on our own. So to get back to first principles here, just so that I'm sure that we're all on the same uh, ground, understanding the terms, um, I'm using evolutionary computing to mean this kind of problem-solving system where you start with random individuals and you have a loop of assessment, selection, and variation um, that continues uh, until something sufficiently good to call a solution emerges. So traditional genetic programming follows this model, and in genetic programming, uh, the way that you can think of it is that the random individuals are programs, because what we're trying to evolve is software. We assess programs typically by running them, we select programs uh, that are better, we vary them, and again, 
uh, handwritten ways, uh, handwritten mutation crossover functions, um, and then we reassess and so on. And if we um, are lucky <laughs> and have set things up well, we end up with software, with programs that solve the problems that we wanted programs to solve. Variation in traditional genetic programming um, typically, typically occurs with what are usually called genetic operators that operate on programs these other programs, and most typically there are three genetic operators, employed mutation, crossover, and straight reproduction. So mutation takes one program and changes it in some way to produce a child. Crossover takes two programs um, and, and does something with the two of them to produce a child program, and straight reproduction simply allows a program to survive. And the key thing, again, is that in traditional genetic programming, mutation and crossover operators are getting configured by humans. In auto-construction, by contrast, the thing that transforms programs into other programs are the programs themselves. Okay? So if a program is going to produce a child, we execute that program, possibly giving it access to other programs for genetic material for meats and so forth. Um, and the execution of the program produces the child program. Okay? That's the core idea of auto-construction, as concisely as I can put it into one slide. Now, it is a bit more complicated when genomes are distinguished from pro uh, programs, as in Autodog, which I'll get to a little bit later. So really, it's the program is executed to produce the genome of the child, which is then expressed to produce the program of the child. But I didn't want to clutter up this diagram with that detail. All right, so to sum up this understanding of autoconstructive evolution, the idea is that individual programs make their own children. In doing so, they control their own mutation and recombination rates and methods, and in some cases, mate selection and other aspects of reproductive behavior. Um, this causes the machinery of reproduction and diversification, which is the machinery of evolution, to itself evolve. Now you may be thinking, how do you evolve programs that are responsible both for solving a problem and for producing their offspring? That sounds like a tall order for these programs. Well, there's a programming language uh, that we use that was developed um, largely for this goal, although it now has many other uses, called PUSH. And uh, PUSH makes it very easy to experiment with auto-constructive evolution. So, um, we will soon have a, a very brief tutorial on, on PUSH in this talk so that we can, um, uh, you can see how we use it to do auto-constructive evolution. Before I get to that, though, I want to point out some of the obvious hazards with auto-constructive evolution. Uh, one is clones. If you have an individual who makes exact clones of itself and it has reasonably good uh, problem-solving performance, then it will be selected as a parent and make clones of itself. And if it fills the population with clones, you will never get anything other than those clones because there is no external source of variation in the system. The variation is produced by the individuals themselves, by the uh, reproductive methods that are encoded within them. Okay? Um, and so if the population is just cloners, then it, there will never be var variation no matter how long you run the system. So that is a, a danger. Another uh, trickier one is what I'm referring to here as dead-enders, but really there are many varieties of dead-enders, and what I mean by that is something which isn't exactly cloning, but nonetheless has no potential to ever produce offspring that behave differently or behave in a better way or that are adaptive in any way. So you can imagine some very simple kinds of dead-enders that, while not producing clones, tack on some useless instructions somewhere in the program where they have no effect. Um, but there may be other kinds of dead-enders which will actually change their, produce children that have different performance uh, than the parents, but um, which then, when they produce children, produce what is a clone of their parent, and so on. There are all sorts of uh, complicated ways in which um, the reproductive systems of, of programs might be unhelpful in terms of producing descendants who are adaptive in the long run, producing adaptive evolution. There's also a different kind of hazard is error catastrophes, which is that um, 
some program does produce children with useful variation and could give rise to an interesting um, uh, lineage of descendants who might be able to solve the program, but there's, they produce too much variation, too many errors, and those descendants end up getting selected against and um, dying out. Um, and that can easily happen as well. So these are things that we have to keep in mind as we work on other constructive evolution. Now I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about PUSH because it is the sort of backbone of all the other constructive evolution systems we've worked with over the years. PUSH is a programming language designed for programs that evolve, not for programs that humans write. Uh, the key idea of PUSH is that data flows via stacks, not via syntax. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. And in contrast to other stack-based languages like Forth that um, have been used over the many years. Um, push has one stack per data type. So there's a separate stack for integers, for floats, for booleans, for strings, and so on. And these two in red here, code and exec, are really crucial. The code of a push program can itself be manipulated on the code stack and then later executed. And the execution of a push program takes place through the use of one of its own stacks, the exec stack. Um, and I'll show you how that works again uh, in, in a moment as well. Um, but this gives a push program uh, quite a lot of power to uh, manipulate code and to um, uh, define and execute novel control structures and data structures. And many, any type you want can be added to a push interpreter. So the push language is syntactically very simple. Any instruction is a program, any literal is a program, and any bunch of programs surrounded by parentheses is a program. It's a Turing complete language. It has rich data and control structures. Uh, the interpreter has one uh, crucial rule that if, if an instruction needs some arguments that are not on stacks, it simply acts as a no-op. It does nothing, and that underlies all of the instructions for all of them. Uh, push GP is what we call any genetic programming system that involves push programs. And there are many versions of push and many GP systems that have built, been built on top of them. I refer to them collectively as push GP systems. So there are implementations of push in many languages. The work that I'm describing here uses a clo closure implementation called Clojish, and you can get more information on all of this from pushlanguage.org. So why do we want to use it? Well, it's an expressive uh, uh, language. Um, it has a minimal syntax and so forth. But the key thing is that it makes it easy to combine the manipulation of programs and genomes with other computations. And that's what makes it sort of an ideal substrate for other constructive evolution. So very briefly, uh, to execute a pro push program, you uh, push the entire program onto the exec stack. While the exec stack isn't empty, you pop and do the top thing which, if it's an instruction, you execute it, usually by taking things off stacks, doing something with them, and pushing something back on stacks. If it's a literal, you push it onto the right stack. If it's a list, you push its elements back onto the exact stack one at a time. Um, we gave a tutorial uh, at the conference on details of push language and uh, some hands-on demonstration. I don't have time to do that today, but I want to show you very briefly that there are Lots of instructions. There are standard stack manipulation instructions for all types. And here are just a smattering of instructions for integers and Boolean values and strings. So you can see some of the kinds of things that are supported. Um, for manipulating the exec stack, you, you get things like conditionals and loops and different kinds of loops um, and combinators. And here are a lot more instructions. I'm just I don't expect you to read these, but I want you to get the sense that uh, uh, we have lots of instructions uh, for, for lots of data types. Uh, so very complete language. Now, how do you do auto-constructive evolution with it? Well, there are a lot of ideas about how you might implement um, the details of the general scheme that I gave before. The first system, 15 years ago, PushPop, was a population of push programs which when they were executed to solve problems, also left around what I'm here calling eggs, bits of code that could be children. And then after um, everybody was tested on the problem, uh, there were tournaments for what I'm here calling hatching rights, who 
whose children's, whose eggs that they've stored up get to be born. Um, and if a, a program that would be born is a clone um, of uh, uh, its parent, then it would not be allowed in the population. And it would be replaced by a new random individual. Uh, the programs in Pushpop could access and run code of the entire population for mating and so forth, um, both while solving problems and while building uh, offspring, babies, which they do at the same time. Here's a, a block diagram of the basic structure of Pushpop, create randomly generated or, uh, organisms, I call them here, uh, test them and produce children, uh, then do fitness tournaments and select the children from there, add randoms if you have too few, and you get child population. Um, now, this was sort of interesting for studying some properties of autoconstructive evolution. We saw that uh, for in certain tests that adaptive populations produce more species and more uh, reliable diversification processes. We saw that selection can actually promote diversity, which is interesting. But the system had very weak problem-solving power, and it was very difficult to analyze the results. Here are some charts uh, showing some of these uh, uh, results that I, I mentioned in the last slide. This is in an artificial life conference uh, proceedings. Got that for you if you're interested. Uh, up in uh, 2005, we developed an autoconstructive evolution system um, in which it's rather different from the standard evolutionary computation system. It was not a problem-solving system. Rather, it was a sort of artificial life model in a 3D virtual world. Uh, but a lot of the same ideas applied about a constructive evolution. Um, and in this system, there was an imposed form of mutation. Everybody did have to have a certain kind of mutation, but the programs could uh, control how much they could control the entire mutation uh, regime. Um, actually, they could, they could define various uh, program manipulation things to make their children. So they, it, it could involve significant kinds of reproductive behaviors. However, then this extra mutation was added, which you could only control the amount of. In any event, uh, this produced a, um, an interesting system. You can see here a little bit of the uh, video of uh, when the first organisms that are capable of producing offspring emerged right there. We just saw that, and now we're seeing many, many more um, uh, individuals being produced, and they're monopolizing the food resources and so on. In any event, um, that was a uh, I'm produced interesting food for thought about autoconstructive evolution, but still was not solving interesting hard problems. In 2010, we developed a system called AutoPush, and we were trying to increase the problem-solving performance. I don't think we really did. Uh, we were also trying to make it more uh, tractable to analyze what was going on, and I do think we did that. And for this, we allowed only asexual reproduction, and we separated the reproductive phase when you make children with the uh, phase of trying to solve the problem. Um, and we had constraints on selection and birth that were more significant than just prohibiting clones. So for example, we preferred parents who had uh, non-stagnant lineages. Um, and so we would look at um, the most recent half of their lineage and uh, for some uh, threshold lineage length, and we would want to see a change in problem-solving performance over that time. And if we didn't see that, we would not let that guy uh, reproduce, or we would prefer uh, We would also prevent birth from lineages with constant differences from each generation to the next. So if the way that parents were making children is unchanged, even if the behavior has changed, um, if the reproductive behavior just produces that same difference in each generation, um, then we prevent them from being born. This was able to solve um, some simple symbolic regression problems, um, and we could analyze what was going on uh, as um, parents produce children and children produce grandchildren and so on. But it still wasn't solving hard problems. Uh, in 2012, uh, Kyle Harrington and uh, Unime O'Reilly and Jordan Pollock and I uh, tried some additional experiments. So this was uh, largely Kyle's work. He looked at different data structures for manipulating programs uh, for them to manipulate their children using zippers and um, looked at synthetic problems 
Um, it maybe helped us to clarify some issues, but again, it was not solving real and interesting problems. So this brings us now to Autodog, which is the current work. Uh, Autodog stands for Autoconstructive Diversification of Genomes. And it differs from the prior work, it sort of mixes and matches some, a lot of the prior ideas, and it's distinctive in these four ways. First off, rather than building the programs of the children, it constructs their genomes. And this builds on some work in push on other non-autoconstructive systems where we developed a linear genome representation for other reasons, um, and we are leveraging that for Autodog as well. We also do have a distinct mode and uh, phase for construction of offspring versus problem solving. Uh, we select parents combinatorially, not on aggregate error. And that's, uh, again, another result of independent work going on in our group. Um, with something called lexicase selection. Um, and finally, we enforce what I'm calling here diversification constraints, which are a, um, I think, more refined version of the ideas of the constraints that I've mentioned so far in this talk. So these four things characterize the newest system, um, and the newest system is now solving some pretty interesting problems. So we thought it was a good time to stop and, uh, and report on all of these contributions. Okay. So in Autodog, what is constructed? Well, in prior work, uh, push programs were constructed and they're manipulated on code stacks using Lisp-inspired code manipulation instructions. In Autodog, we instead construct what we call plush genomes, which are linear sequences of genes that specify instructions along with epigenetic markers that determine structure when plush genomes are translated into push programs prior to running them. So this is what a plush genome looks like, yet it's a sequence of instructions. Those are push instructions, but the structure where the parentheses go is not in the genome. Well, it's not in the, in the instruction list. It's in these epigenetic markers. This close marker says how many um, uh, parentheses close at a particular instruction. And instructions themselves specify whether or not parentheses are opened after. So uh, uh, instructions that expect structure in the code near them specify that they open parentheses and then the parentheses are closed via epigenetic markers. We also have silencing markers that simply cause the uh, genome to program translation uh, process to skip over the genes. Okay? And um, this is useful for a variety of things that have nothing to do with autoconstructive evolution. And we're using it for most of our regular genetic programming work. We're evolving plush genomes now, uh, in part because it allows kind of uh, a simpler, uniform, uh, linear genetic operators to be applied to programs, even though they're structured programs. It also allows for something called epigenetic hill climbing, which uh, Bill LaCava has been experimenting with and shows that that can produce um, some good results. Um, in order to build children using plus genomes, we have a genome stack and we have a bunch of instructions uh, implemented for the genome stack that allows you to change things in genomes. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but they're in the paper. How and when is the offspring constructed? Well, in prior work, there are various schemes, sometimes during error testing, sometimes with problem inputs, sometimes with imposed but controllable variation. In Autodog, it is only uh, within the auto-construction genetic operator, um, so it's not during problem solving, it's, it's, it's just during uh, the uh, genetic operator phase of a push GP system, and it's done entirely by running the program to produce its child, okay? Um, so, yeah, and in that construction phase, any inputs to the program are no-ops. So, if you're solving a problem involving floating point number inputs, when you're trying to solve the problem, they'll be available, but when you're making a child, all those inputs will just be no ops. And during the uh, error testing phase, um, when you're, you're testing how well the program solves the problem, the random instructions will be no ops because you'll wa you want your error testing to be deterministic, even though your construction of offspring uh, may involve randomness. And who constructs? What parents are selected and allowed to make children? Well, in prior work, we did what most people do, which is use aggregating methods of parent selection, like tournament selection, based on total error. Uh, but in Autodog, we use lexicase selection, and I want to describe what that is very briefly. Um, 
you, you're testing on multiple test cases, and when you do this, to, when you, uh, you just keep the errors for all the test cases, you don't add them up. And when you want to select a, a parent, you shuffle the test cases. For the first test case, you keep all the best individuals in the population. Then for the next case, you keep all the best individuals of that group. And then so on for each test case until you're down to a single individual or until um, you run out of test cases and then you select randomly from those who are left. Okay. Uh, the key thing is here that uh, the selected parent may be a specialist in the tests that happen to have come first in that parent selection event and may or may not be particularly good on average. This encourages uh, a lot of diversity in the parents who are selected, and uh, that may be important for lex case selection working well. All right, uh, this, I just threw this on here to show we have a journal article in IEEE Transactions and Evolutionary Computation about uh, lex case selection and show that it's very useful in problem solving contexts. This has nothing to do with auto constructive evolution. All right, now, who gets to survive? And this is maybe what I think is the deepest issue in this entire project. In the prior work, first we tried letting everybody survive who's not a clone. Then we said, oh, you only get to survive if you satisfy certain constraints on progress within lineages and so forth. In Autodog, we've really tried to step back and think through this question of who gets to survive. And to say only those, you can only survive if you satisfy diversification constraints on reproductive behavior, which is determined from a cascade of temporary descendants. So we create some descendants and sometimes some descendants of those descendants. And we look at whether we see in there the signatures of um, a healthy, diversifying uh, reproductive process that could give rise to adaptive evolution. So what we use here is we, the constraint that children must differ from the parent differently from each other. So we create two children. They each have to differ from the parent, and they have to differ from the parent in different amounts. Um, and we apply this to the programs, not just the genomes. So uh, we express the programs from the genomes that are produced by the construction process, and then we look at the relation between parent program and child program. And we enforce it on a cascade with only two children. So it looks like this. Parent is executed twice to make two children, and then the parent-child differences uh, have to both be positive and not same. You could do it with more children. Here we just do it with two. Now this diversification constraint is still under development and um, um, the, the hard question, which I don't have a final answer for, is how can you tell if an individual has the potential to produce diverse adaptive descendants and will give rise to an evolutionary process and an evolving evolutionary process? Um, some of the things that we're currently considering are larger cascades uh, in which we assess the variation um, of the genomes, so not just the um, programs, but also the genomes themselves, um, the reproductive behavior of various subgroupings within the cascade, and the problem-solving behavior, which we are not looking at at all in this uh, current constraint, but it's possible. Okay. All right. So the hard thing is how do you get evolution to evolve? And there's sort of three levels of um, variation that uh, you could look at. One is just diversity, which is where individuals vary. Another is diversification, where individuals produce descendants that vary. Um, and so that's something on the production of descendants, not just on the individuals themselves. And you want the descendants to vary in various ways, right? You want, um, you don't want one method of variation in there. You want the methods of variation to vary and to evolve. And finally, the sort of least clear category, what I'm calling here recursive variance, is that individuals produce descendants that vary in the ways that they vary their offspring. Okay? Um, and that, I'd say we're playing with a lot of ideas for that, but um, don't have a final one yet. So to see how this works, we looked at some software synthesis benchmark problems. These are problems taken from um, uh, primarily from uh, introductory programming textbooks for human programmers. Um, and we've been applying uh, PushGP to these uh, software synthesis problems. And PushGP uh, can solve most of these. Um, and this is uh, presented in a uh, Gecko 2015 uh, paper. 
um, on uh, benchmark, software synthesis benchmark uh, problems. And the one that we looked at here is called replace space with new line. And that's uh, given an input string, print the string, replacing spaces with new lines. Also return the integer count of the non-white space characters. The input st string will not have tabs or new lines. And it's, it's somewhat tricky. It requires multiple types. It requires looping. Um, there's two different outputs required. Uh, here is a simplified solution, so you can produce it. It's pretty tough to do with push GP, but we can do it. And in fact, in our most recent experiments, we've gotten success rates of up to 95%. So 95% of the is producing a solution. Um, Autodog does not do as well, okay? And um, I don't want to give the impression that it does. However, it can solve the problem. Um, it is a hard problem, and it can solve it. Um, so you get the sense that something is going right with our current setup. But what is going right? Well, we're not sure yet, but what we're doing and presenting in this paper is we're looking at, in some detail at how it works. So here is uh, the differences between parent and children uh, of a normal GP run, a normal genetic programming run on this problem. And you can see that after some initial settling out, most parents and children um, have a relatively small distance from one another. Um, yeah. It's, uh, and it's all clustered down here near the, um, near the zero line. Okay? Um, and there's a pretty consistent uh, kind of variation from parent to child. Well, what happens with Autodog? It looks like that. That is one run, and every run looks different. But this is what um, the kind of thing that we see in, within Autodog runs. And... I hope that you find this interesting. I find it fascinating. I am not sure what's going on, why it's going on, but we can see that something very different is happening than is happening in the standard genetic program. Okay? We also look here at genome sizes. Um, this is standard, uh, our, our regular push GP setup. This is the genome sizes um, of all genomes across a, a successful run. Um, on this problem. And again, in autoconstructive evolution, we see something very different, okay? Um, so some very unusual features to this uh, graph showing how the genome sizes progress over the run. And what that tells us is whether or not this is evolving well, whether or not it's a good problem-solving method, it is showing that something interesting is happening to reproductive methods during autoconstructive evolution. Okay? The ways in which children are produced change, changes. The ways change, and they change in complex ways. Um, so I would make the case, based on these graphs, uh, for the title of this paper, which is that evolution evolves with auto-construction. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's evolving in the ways that we want yet, and sometimes it does, and it does solve problems. But it is certainly evolving. Evolution is evolving. Variation is evolving. Um, and I think that means that we are um, getting into the interesting territory of auto-constructive evolution. Here is another graph. This is very hard to read uh, in detail, but uh, these are ancestry graphs, uh, ancest all the ancestors of solutions from a run um, of a standard operator genetic programming system versus auto-constructive evolution. And um, I'm not going to explain in detail the uh, graphing conventions here, but they are, um, um, I, I think you can see that these two graphs have rather different character, um, and um, variation happens differently in them, um, and, you know, we've been staring at a lot of these graphs and trying to understand what's going on in auto-construction versus regular genetic programming, and it's ongoing work. So conclusions. Um, Autoconstructive evolution can now solve reasonably hard problems at least some of the time. Uh, so far, it takes longer, and that's not surprising because it's trying to evolve evolution, uh, or at least variation, along with evolving solutions. I hope um, that it will someday be able to solve problems that can't be solved by ordinary genetic programming. Um, we don't know that. Um, but the reason that's not a crazy thing to think is that it evolves. So it should be able to um, find ways of evolving solutions that um, are different from and perhaps better than those that we produce. 
studying how and why it works may help us to improve it. And st studying how and why it works may also help us to understand the evolution of biological evolution itself. I want to thank um, members of the Hampshire College Computational Intelligence Lab um, for many uh, interesting discussions about this. And uh, anonymous reviewers also contributed in some really constructive ways. Uh, and Josiah Erickson helps us do all our runs. And Hampshire College and the National Science Foundation have also been very generous. Thank you very much.